Hello everyone again and we are going to be talking today about translations. So let me share the screen so you can see my presentation. And here it is. All right. So international internationalization, that's what I18N means. That's I and 18 letters in between and an N. Um, whoever comes up with that abbreviation is, is brilliant. So we are going to be talking about how to bring the carpentries to your own language. And even though I'm the speaker today, many of the things I'm going to show here is, hasn't been done by me, has been done by a lot of people. So let's start by, let's start by seeing what we actually mean by internationalization. So here we have three examples of a lessons that have been translated. The top left, uh, I can put this thing here, right? So the top left, corner, it's about a lesson converted into Spanish. Then here we have some in Korean and here we have some in Japanese. And just by seeing the lesson on all these different characters, it makes me happy in that way. So how can you do that the same for your own language and how, how the mechanism behind the scenes have been work in all those different lessons. And that's what we will see. So. Let's look a bit of a history first and see what has been translated already, as far as I know. And here we have a long list of lessons in Spanish, not only lessons, but also things like the workshop template uh, and the handbook as well of the carpentries. And that was one of the most important ones because that's where the code of conduct is. So we, in the case of a handbook, have only the so far, it's only the code of conduct. If you go to the lesson, so sorry, if you go to the slides that are in the etherpad, you can click on each of them and you can see the repositories of all of those. So all of those are links that you can uh, see. So the first lesson that was translated was a, the old sower carpentry, all material, all repository into a single repository. All the lessons were there. And we did that back in 2014. And that was never finished. That was not, um, there were a, a lot of progress in a couple of days, but yeah, that I have the cross because we are not using that. And that was not um, fully qualified as a proper translation that we could use. Then we got a lot of effort over the last two years. And here we got uh, lessons of Git, of R, of Python. And all of them have been very uh, active and it has been translated in very short time like in, in less than a month, the whole lesson, all those lessons, like not all of the lessons have been translated in less than a month, but each lesson took like less than a month to be translated by a group of people. And some of them are still work in progress, like the instructor training into Spanish. Some of the bits have been translated, others are still needs to be uh, translated. The handbook, as well as I say, so far only the code of conduct has been translated. And the last one that we started last month into in a, in a translaton, kind of session, it was the R um, for your spatial data. So all that, so the first one was uh, started by Fran Navarro uh, as part of the Mozilla science kind of a hackathon that uh, that's how I connected back then. And then some of those translations has been hosted on the Carpentry S, others on the Software Carpentry main and data carpentry main repositories. And lately, the last ones have been trans uh, hosted into the carpentries I18N, which is what I'm going to begin talking about on how that all infrastructure works behind the scenes. Besides the Spanish lessons, I know as well that the Japanese have done a lot, and that's what uh, um, the lessons I've been, I've been able to find that I have some translation done. I don't know what is fully status of all of them, but there is uh, some movement on them. For example, the R novice gap miner has been even uh, updated like a few days ago. And they are using the same infrastructure that the I18N that I will explain later, um, but they are hosting it in a, a different repository for now or a different organization under the, the GitHub. There's also a lot of effort done in the Korean translations and that I don't know much about it. There's a blog post uh, where you can read how they form, and that was even before the carpentries formed themselves as such. So 
some of the lessons looks more of the old style of the software carpentry lessons. And all is hosted under uh, Quan Chun Li. And, and yeah, I, I don't know exactly the state of those translations and whether they has been uh, kept up to date. But as we can see on the dates on each repository, they haven't been touched, uh, some of them since 2019. That's not a bad thing because maybe more, many of those lessons haven't changed much since then, but uh, they are there. And also there's some in Portuguese that Ranieri Silva started also back in the old repository of the BC repository. And also the, the workshop template uh, is being also translated into Portuguese. Now, right, so that's what we have, all the history that I, as far as I know regarding translations, at least, uh, we will go in the middle of detail how these translations happen, but so far that's what I know it's available there. So what do we need to do a translation? What do we need to, if we want to, to translate a carpentry's material or actually anything, but focusing to the carpentry's material. So the first thing we need is a translation model. And I can see, maybe there are more, but I can see at least two translation models. One of them is a translation model as a book where someone writes a book and then that book gets translated like literally letter by letter um, into different languages. So each book, it's the same in terms of the content, in terms of the story behind, it's all the same. Sometimes the expressions used are slightly different and the translators have the freedom to, to adapt those to the, to the translation, but essentially they're the same thing. The other model, is a Wikipedia model and where we have a article that may have been written in English, for example, originally, and maybe originally started as translations. So here we have three examples of a, a Python um, page in Wikipedia. And as you can see, even the first paragraph are different between the three languages. I mean, it, at least the length of it are different. So they may have started as a translation, but they evolve differently. They don't have a a, like the same thing like the book. They all try to, to improve and to add content to it, but they don't have a, they're not as strict of trying to keep all in the same level. And it has its advantages as well. They, they don't need to be guided by a source language. They all can evolve as they fit. Now, the, there's a, Good things and bad things. So the good things on, on the book translation is that when there is a next edition, a, the writer have a second edition of the book, it's easy to track what has been changed. What are the lines and the paragraphs that it needs to be updated? So that each translator of each, uh, in each language can focus on those pages or on those paragraphs and, and the new edition in those translations can happen straight away. Whereas in Wikipedia, you cannot really track that thing. Uh, even how, so it contains a tracking system and you can see what's different between one day and another. It's quite challenging because as I say, your version of the history in, in your page, you may have been already diverging. So it's not really useful. However, in the Wikipedia side, you, you have more freedom to adapt it to the cultural um, sense of the language. And that's sometimes refer as well as localization, where you may want to, to if there's an example on the, on the main page on the source language, say source language is, is English, and they, they talk about cricket. In the Spanish page, cricket doesn't mean anything. So, I mean, we know there's a sport, but whatever example, whatever symbol you put there with cricket, it will be really difficult uh, for us. So, it could be localized to some more uh, sample that makes more sense on, on the Spanish or Chinese version. Now that also has, as I said, also happens on the books translations where the translator may have a freedom to do those kind of changes. Uh, but on the Wikipedia style will be like more, it could be diverged a lot and it wouldn't be difficult, it wouldn't be easy to track back. Okay, so now if we have a translation model, which I would say that for the categories, the book model, it fits better. Then we can go to the next thing, a tracking mechanism. 
how we see the differences. And of course, we teach Git. We have GitHub repositories. We all are like, Git is the amazing tool that we all want. So let's use Git. And that's what happened in 2014. So during the first translation I was involved in the cabin trees, we came up with a, a bit of convoluted model uh, on how to translate the lesson. So we have, say, a lesson, an episode of a lesson, say. So we have a file with could contain some markdown or some scripts or whatever. And that file, the last version of that file has a hash. Now that's where it comes to the interesting bit. So we will create a new folder for the translation. So we will have a folder for Spanish, for Italian, for French. And we come up with the idea, say, okay, because we're gonna have a file and we really want to see what have changed on the original file. Let's keep track of the number of that hash. So essentially we have that file contains a new um, hash uh, for the translation and we will write in the comments something like based on that hash. So that when there's a new version coming up for that particular file, we have a new hash and we could see, we could run the difference and say, okay, what is the difference in that file between this hash and that hash? And then we will know what has changed and we could translate that. And that's great, till you start to use it. And you find that, first of all, a file is not all translated into once. It's not all done the translation in one uh, commit. So you will have a lot of commits referring to the same commit. Also, uh, the translators may not be too familiar with Git. And we have, a, a, we have to track that commit and and that has a, to do, to be a manual process. So it's going to be really, really difficult to do that in a consistent way. Anyway, that didn't last long. That was the first effort that we tried to do. And, and because it was all the whole repository of, with all the lessons that was kind of a, um, difficult to keep going. And then in 2016, a, another group of people out of from the Spanish community started to translate lessons again. And that time we have all the lessons separated in different repositories. So we have a lesson with the source and what we did was a fork in that lesson. So we could have a, a fork of the original lesson and, and then we will translate on the same files straight away. That makes things easier because you don't have, um, you can be translated on the same file and yeah, then you think, okay, the next time that we pull again for the new version, so when there's a new version of the lesson, we pull from it and we will see conflicts. And that will be great because it will tell us exactly where it's failing. So we have our lesson translated with the changes of the lesson and there will be conflicts to solve. And so that shouldn't be too hard, except that whoever has to do that pull will get all the conflicts and you won't be able to push again to the same repository because the lesson won't be um, uh, rendering properly. So it, it will put all the effort on one person that is pulling and saying, okay, now we have to translate that. Or it would put some time of a time gap where we cannot really work uh, rendering the lesson or you will have to work around and put it in a different branch and have the people working in that branch. And again, you will need these people, translators, uh, be familiar with the Git, and you will put more effort into cleaning the repository in terms of, of those conflicts than rather working on the translations. The other problem, as with the previous one as well, is that we don't really know how much is left for translate. Uh, we don't really know how much conflicts needs to be solved. I mean, you can write some scripts and try to count them, but it, you, you lose the feeling of, how much has been translated and how much it needs to be done yet. So then in 2017, 2018, I come back uh, with a new idea and it is not my idea. It's what most of the software is uh, done across the world when they do um, uh, translations. So I've been talking with the people in GNOME, with the people in Mozilla, try, I tried to gather how they were doing it. And the solution was that they were using a tool um, or a similar tool like new get text. So that tool essentially uh, takes some source code. It could be a markdown file. It could be a code. 
could be anything. And you run through the program and you get a, what is called a POT file. That's kind of a template where each block, each piece of text is separated into kind of, um, is tokenized into blocks. So that it makes easy to track from the original source and, and the translation. So as you can see, I, in that image, I just separated like paragraphs and put the space in the middle. And that's because then after that, you have this template and you can create those files, these PO files into different language. So for example, we have in the top Spanish and Japanese, and as you can see, they have different blue lines or green lines. And that means that they are different. They might have different lengths, uh, the translations, and you have the source, you, the, the, the paragraph the, uh, on the top and the translation on the bottom. And then using the tooling that GetText um, provides, then you can convert that into the markdown in the same way that it was originally. That has a lot of advantages and I'm gonna show you an example, but mostly it uh, gives you an idea of how much is left to translate. And it gives you an idea also of other things like how much hasn't been reviewed because it has like a lot of different flags that you can put into those files. You can even save their notes for the translators. So if the translator next time a different translator comes to look into that file, can see some notes regarding that uh, text. Now, if the original thing changed, so now I have these uh, source files that have some green bytes, bits that have changed on the original source, the software, it helps also to bring this, um, changes across to the POT and converted them into the, the PO of the languages. And as you can see, I have like a small icons here that it shows that if this file of such a change, it keeps uh, in the same status as obviously before. So it has been reviewed, it's keep reviewed. But if something has changed, it keeps the text from before, but it marks them for review. It says something has changed. So keep an eye on that. Um, however, if you keep moving that and converting the markdown as it was uh, um, as before, it won't disappear that text. It will keep it as it was. And, and it still will work and you could keep uh, tracking of what has changed and the people could look into that. So that tool also tells when something is new and it, it marks it for review, which it makes it uh, kind of easier than the, the conflict, the, conflict resolution that we were saying before when, when we were only using Git. Okay, so how does it work in practice? What does it require? So first thing, when I was working into trying to find how to convert that into POs, I found a, that a random person on the internet called Sam Ho Cho, um, he created, or she, I actually don't know, um, created a, a tool to convert Git books into POs. And the Git books are books based on Markdown. So that was great for the server vocabulary lessons. The only thing I needed to adapt was for taking account into the formatting of code that we have, the uh, 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 peculiarities that we have on the carpentry's material, which is not a kind of a standard across the board. So we were, I have to take care of those things to use it like the solution, the challenges, the code blocks, the outputs, all those kind of things, I have to adapt the code. So I adapted the code and that was great. So we were getting from a, a whole lesson, we were converting all the whole lesson into a single POT file. And, and then the same process applies. So that was into the Spanish translation and then that moved into the markdown files all into its own file. Now, one of the advantages of the PO files is, as you can see here in the example, is that when you have something repeated multiple times, like the flag challenge, it doesn't appear 100 times. It appears only once, and it refers to all the lines that it comes from the source um, files. So whenever there's some replication on the, on the source file, the PO um, or the get text tooling kind of uh, aggregate them together. So you don't need to translate the same thing once and again and again and again. So, that's how a, a file looks like, one of those PO files. And you have see that we have a, the source. So here we have a larger example where we have 
um, the header of a lesson. And then underneath you have this message string, which is where you will write the translation. Now that's how the plain text looks like, but normally you don't need to use to work on those files as a plan, a plain text file. You have, you can use it with any text editor and the biggest text editors normally have some kind of plugins to work with it. So it makes the, that to look nicer. There's also some specialized editors and those specialized editors have uh, other tooling around like translation memory, glossaries, a uh, place where you can take notes for later. So here I saw some examples and they work, uh, many of them works uh, in Linux, Windows and Mac. And as I say, if you go to the original slides, all of those are links. So you can go to the links to the plugins needed for your favorite text editors or um, for the specialized editors. And then additionally, there's some online tools like Transiface, Crowding, Sanata, Weblay, Poodle. So those are like kind of an online version of those uh, text editors that more specialized text editor. So uh, from there, you can also benefit of something else, which is the next point, having a collaborative translation platform. So if you're gonna have a group of translators, what you want is them all to translate together. So this is an example of Transifex. And that's how a file like the one I showed before is shown. So here you have on the left column, you have the original source language. On the right hand side, you have a, the translations that you're building. Whenever you click on one of these, you get the top, the original source, and here you write the translation. As you can see here, it says unreview or review, so it allows uh, also for a reviewer to go and check the translations. It has other toolings like some suggestions based on other parts of the lesson or the, it shows the history, what has changed between one and another. It, it keeps also a glossary, so one of the things that you want to keep in the translation is consistency. So you don't want to call something with 10 different names um, across the lesson. So uh, glossary tooling helps to keep that in track. And also you can write comments. So to message other translators and to say, oh, I translate that, but I don't know exactly whether we need to change that or whether that's the best uh, translation done in this case or not. Essentially, all the online tools, even the um, uh, desktop tools, looks in this way. You have blocks for the original source and the, and the translation, and you can go one by one. And on the top, you get some statistics of how much you have to translate, what has been uh, translated already, what is still to review. Cool. So the next thing is what uh, I've been working on is to keep that in a centralized way to show all the translations. Essentially, what I've done is create a, a theme, uh, a Jekyll theme. So uh, Jekyll allows now to have a theme where multiple blocks or multiple sites that use that theme looks the same. So essentially what I've done is to look the normal lessons. So that's here we have the lesson on R and that you can in the same place, you can click on the little world globe and, and see what translations are available. And when you click there, you can jump to that particular episode into Spanish. And when you're in the Spanish one, you can click back and go back to the English in case that uh, imagine that you're teaching and you have uh, students from different uh, languages and then when they go back home and they want to review the lesson, they can go to the lesson that uh, they prefer in the language that they prefer. Okay, so that's the theme. Now, how do we put all together? And that's where we use Git. Now, what I'm using, what I, I come across, I mean, this is a, a way I managed to do it. And I'm happy to review that with more people, while more people getting on board and trying to see whether this is a better solution. But so far, my best approach has been to have a hub. So this is the I18N repository under the Carpenter's I18N. And, and essentially, we have that hub where we keep a, we pin a particular lesson on a, part, uh, on a particular date. So we, we take submodules, get some modules, and we keep that, uh, um, that. So we know when that was uh, brought down and copied. And then we have this PO folder, and that's where all the files, the, these PO files are tracked. So let's look into a, a particular sample. So for example, here we got the R intro, geospatial, which is based on a particular uh, version on the original source language. 
and we have created the, the POT with that tool I showed before. Now, once we got the POT file, we upload that to, in this case, TransFX is the tool that we are using. And here we have a group of people from different languages and from different communities, and they are translated that into any language they need. So for example, if they have translated into Spanish, we can then download from TransFX that Spanish file. And once that we got that Spanish file from TransFX, we can then generate the markdown file. So here we have a different repository, which is also hosted in the same organization, but we call it with the lesson name and the language code. So here you see that we only have the markdown files. We don't have any of the other additional files needed to render the lesson because then that repository is embedded as a submodule into the original lesson. So here we have the original lesson and under a folder called locale, we keep a Spanish folder which is linking to this lesson. And now when we have that and with the theme, it shows that you have multiple languages in the same lesson. Okay, so what advantage we got here? So first of all, the, this submodule here is not too intrusive for the source lessons because uh, whenever someone cloned that lesson, by default, Git doesn't pull the submodules. So it will appear there as something that people may, may, may not want to touch. So it's not too intrusive. Secondly, in the hub, we maintain a control of what's done and what's updated, so we can keep of a track of what lessons are behind and what lessons uh, need to be brought to date. The hub maintainer, it doesn't need to know anything about the languages. It only needs to know how to work with the Git, Git modules, and the POT workflow. It doesn't need to care about whether the lessons are good or not. Someone will tell them, say, okay, these lessons are ready, ready to pull, so pull it, and and follow the magic. And everything, most of the things have already been automated, but it can be even automated even more. So the maintainer might only need to take an eye of what's going on. So it keeps things quite simple in that, in that perspective. Now, when to translate? You may want to come here, you have interests on a language, and you say, when, when, when can I start to translate? So translate all the things now, all the lessons. Go ahead. Um, and if you haven't started yet, let me know, and I will show you the process now, but uh, start with something, and then we can work from that. However, there's a, a thing that I would like also to discuss, the kind of a model on when to translate, or when to keep lessons up to date. So here we are gonna show two models. One is like a quasi real time. So we have on the left, this, the source lessons, and on the right, we have the translated lesson. So these are Git commits. So imagine that the lesson is updated, or typos and then we pull it and we translate it. Then something else is, is change it and then pull it and translate it. That's quite um, resource intensive in terms of the people. So they will need to be there and translating and translating them, which it might be good and people may up to that because they only need to translate little bits every so and then. And the other way will be to translate every time that is a release. So here, for example, we got an original translation and then we don't translate again till that lesson gets to another state of a release. So whenever it's a year or whenever we, that lesson follows a kind of a release a calendar where they put the lesson as a new version, then we can pull from it and translate it. Of course, here we'll need, you will need to translate maybe a lot more than in this way, but the advantage is that here, things you may translate and then you know, they might disappear later, uh, where in the in the release base you kind of convince that you know here is a release here is not changing anything and that's what we're going to publish so there's when you you spend a week to translate what it needs to be translated and again when it's version two and stuff uh, in the sober world I I've seen that some communities work in one way other communities work in the other uh, and not even communities of the software in itself but even in the in the languages so some languages will want to uh, translate it more quickly than others. And either of both are okay. Now, how do we start a new language? So you want to, you're here and you want to translate your lesson into Swahili. And there's nothing done about that yet. So first thing I will suggest you is to tell me. You can do that by emailing me or opening an issue on the IA theme and lesson, uh, sorry, repository. 
tell me which lesson it is and which into which language you want to translate it. Then the second thing I will suggest to you is to read the documentation I, I written as a translator guide, which it tells you what you should translate, what you should not translate, what you should keep an eye on the translation. I will show you an example in a bit. Then create an account in Transifex. That's the tool that we are using now. That might change in the future uh, because other tools may have better um, tooling that I, uh, I'm exploring and see how to use it. So I created a video a while ago on how to use, as you can see there in the corner, I used to have more of hair there. And there you can see how to use Transifex. Number four, if find a group of people that can help you. So go, go to the forum and write and say, hey people, I, I'm going to translate this lesson into Italian. I need Italian people helping me. And, and then probably for sure you will get people there and say, oh, that's interesting. Yes, sure, I can help. And there's also a Slack channel in called internationalization where you can also ask for, see whether there's some people there that speak your language and get some help. And finally, if you're the first language, to, the first person to come into that language, define some rules. So define what's going to be translated. Define what's the gender and person you're going to use. So English, in many examples, doesn't have a gender and the verbs, but in Spanish, we do. So you need to, um, well, in Spanish, we don't do in the verb, but in other language, you have the gender and the verb. So you might want to fix those things. Those rules don't necessarily need to be like super strict. You may update those rules in the future, and that's good but at least to keep consistency in the first lesson between the other translators that might help you. So they find some rules. So if you want to see some examples, also there's a link here that it shows you what we did with the Spanish lessons. And what's next? That's my last slide. So from my point of view, I need, um, there's some things that you will need to so work around. So the first thing is uh, errors detection and hopefully to do that automatically. So for example, one of the last lessons we translated into Spanish when we render it, we found this thing. As you can see, we get a episode six, episode eight, and episode seven is blank. Okay, so you go into that page to see what happened. And you can see that we've got the header, the, the um, summary that you get in the header of the lessons, but there's nothing there. I'm like, hmm, what's wrong with that? Okay, maybe that was something we forgot to put the proper flags on, the less, on, on that header. So we go to GitHub and we look at the header. And that's interesting. We get the three lines that we need to put on the header. So that really seems okay. However, if you're familiar with the, how the lessons look in GitHub, that's how the English one looks like. It doesn't look the same. So GitHub renders them as a table, but here we're not getting that table. So I'm gonna let you like a minute to look into, into what is there and try to let you see whether you guess where the problem is. You don't need to know Spanish. Um, and it took me a while to find out, but try to look around and see whether you see something weird. No pressure, Francois. I hope that you find that straight free away. <laughs> Okay. Is there um, an extra space at the top of the file? Nope. <laughs> it's very, it's a very silly, well, very silly. It's very subtle uh, error and it's visible. It's not any space that you cannot see. It's something visible, but our eyes completely ignore it. The indentation of the YAML is wrong? Nope. You're going in the same way I was going. <laughs> and that's not it. Okay. You have two, your two chances. And I'm going to give you a third one in case that you fail. So the problem is here. Do you see that quotes and that period after the quotes? <laughs> that makes it fail. And yeah, of course, if you look at it, you don't, you, your eyes don't see the thing because it's, it seems normal sentence. It seems a normal thing. And that's normal that we are used to look at for. But there's errors like this. And not only on the headers, it's also on the, on the code that has been converted. There is some errors as well on the translation because the translator, I mean, is a person. He's writing those things and he gets those kind of uh, mistakes sometimes. And, and it's really hard even for the reviewer to find them out. So I'm trying to collect a list of these kind of things 
so that people can, when they're reviewing, they can keep an eye. But I would love to have this uh, in an automatic way. And in this case, it may be easy because we could see that a, some, some things GitHub is already finding them wrong. wrong. So it probably if we use some kind of uh, tooling to read the markdown, it will say, hey, there's something wrong. So we could flag them uh, uh, in, a, in a way that a linter does and get, get some stats on that thing. All right, so that's regarding errors detection. The other thing I would like to do is to automate the lessons creation. So I was asking you uh, if you want a new lesson to write it in GitHub. So ideally, I would love to have some kind of GitHub actions, maybe that it reads that, extract that thing, and creates all these steps that I've done. So those, all of those are really well documented. I've been documented all that on a, on a kind of a handbook, as you can see. And there's a lot of steps, and one of those steps are manually. Uh, done by someone, um, even though many of them are already kind of automated, still I, I need to go step by step. It doesn't take long, but it still is, is a bit tedious. So it will be better if, if I could automate that. So if you want to help on that, please contact me. Uh, the other thing that is that we need, either you as a translator or you want to start a new committee on translation or me or anyone is to find editors for each lesson. Editors on each lesson will be like maintainers on the original source languages lessons, but with less work because they don't have to worry about pull requests and stuff. They only need to worry, well, only to check that the when we need to pull a new lesson and trying to to collect the community, call the other people in the community to come up and and work together in the translation whenever they need it, and and keep an eye, kind of get more authorship on the lesson in itself. In the, in the source language. Finally, I, well, finally, still, what I would like as well to get is some maintainers to help me with the I18N. As I say, you, it's not language expertise, any other language and knowledge needed. Uh, if you are familiar with Git and GitHub and you're interested to get into this world of getting different lessons and Jekyll to work with multiple lessons, uh, I will be glad to get you with me here. And then finally, one thing that I started to do, but I, I still need more work, is to create on that IIT and repository to get some kind of a GitHub pages showing the statistics uh, of what lessons are being translated, what lessons need to be, uh, what are in progress, when was the last time pool, some information that may help to the instructors and to the learners when they go to the lesson and say, oh, is that the last version or is that like three years ago? So get some kind of a, a dashboard with that. And with that, I finish. I would like to thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you all of you to come here. In particular, I would like to thank Fran Navarro back in 2014 when convinced me, I have never met him, uh, but we worked together for the first translation and part of the Mozilla Science Lab uh, into Spanish. I will also give a big thanks to Tom Kelly, who was one of the early adopters of my crazy experiment of the I-18N. And, and he used it a lot for the Japanese team and they have been quite active. And of course, I couldn't leave without thanking all the Spanish uh, speaking community, in particular, Paula and Florencia, who has, me, has helped me a lot uh, in the last um, translatons we ran uh, as part of the Carpentry Con at Home Conference. And everyone who participated in those calls and everyone who has been participating over the last three, four years on the translations on the carpentries. And that's all for me. So I'm going to stop now sharing the screen and I'm going to look into the questions that we have already in the editor pack. So let me bring the questions. And here we say, I can't see anything. There you go. Okay, so please feel free to unmute yourself or put your hands up. We still have 15 more minutes of discussion. Uh, okay, let's start with the hands up. Uh, Giacomo, please unmute yourself and let me know what you want. And uh, video. Hey, thanks, uh, David, for uh, this great project. And I definitely hope to contribute something at some point. Just one question. Are the current translated lessons for the moment all translation of the English sources? of the English originals. Uh, to where and what? So the, the current translation are, in Spanish? Yeah. Are so, these it, all, 
Yeah, are these all translations of, of uh, the original in English language? Yeah, yes, yes, that's right. So the, the, the lesson has been, the original language, the source language, as I will the call source it, language, has been yeah. always in English so okay. far. But this, yeah. this will work even if the source language is not in English. Um, so if someone in South Africa starts with a lesson in, in Osa, for example, yeah, and yeah. we want to translate it into English, this yeah. tooling will also work. Yeah, I would understand that. Yes, and the next question for the future maybe. What if the translated, a translated lesson starts becoming even better than the original? Is there, do you think about a way of feeding that into the source? Yeah. So, so it happens sometimes that when we are translating, we find typos. And not only going to the content yet, but the, the thing that has happened so far is that we find typos in the source language. Uh, so the, the way to contribute back uh, is you put the right translation into the Spanish, for example, go and make a pull request to the source. And when we pull for the next version, we will pull the next time, that will be already fixed. Uh, and we will keep that, uh, we, we will see that that's has been already translated. Uh, if we go into something bigger, like saying that on the translation team, we come up with a better example, and that's, that's or, or we come up with a, some extra material that we would like to add to the Spanish lesson, that is where the Wikipedia model is, is, is what I was talking at the beginning. Like, uh, it will start to diverge and that's very difficult. So my system right now doesn't accommodate for that because you don't touch the markdown files. You only touch those files that are produced uh, to keep the translation. So I would say that in those cases, we could edit the markdown files, uh, but that would be the risk of the next time we pull or we push the, the updates translation files, it will be removed. So it will be something that we will have to work out a mechanism to do that. Uh, but yeah, that's a concern of, of how we will do that, how we will solve that. My ideal, you know, my ideal world will be like, if it's something that is good, it should go to all the lessons. So it should, maybe we should propose to the source lesson and then everyone will benefit uh, rather than diverge path. Yeah, thank you, very clear. Okay, what other question we got here? So we got on the other path, something that says, what do you think about writing a guide to translating capital relations and resources based on this presentation? Yeah, so we, I have, so I've been writing this documentation as it's, it's been mentioned there, uh, and it's the links on the presentation. So if you look at the slides, all the images I have there, pretty much even the source code is pointing to that particular files. Uh, but yes, we have this, uh, the I18 uh, handbook documentation where uh, I, I've been trying to document everything, all the little bits of us from the point of view as a translator, all the point of view from the maintainer of the lesson and, and, and things that we need to put in place with the maintainers of the source lessons and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's there. Uh, can be added to the Carpentry Handbook. Yes, it can. Uh, my only problem already so far is that I need to come to, to talk, to reach the maintainers on the carpentries of each particular lesson uh, to actually implement the thing. And because right now I have two things. One is the submodules for the languages. And the other thing is this, the, uh, the I'm using this carpentry theme, which some of the new lessons are using the theme already that Francois has done, but, um, a, we will need to have a, a to unite that theme. And my team so far is not still perfect. There's some problems and some things that need to be solved yet. Um, but what I need is more users, more language, more people helping to, to keep moving this thing forward. Uh, okay, and I choose other questions for the one that we solved already. Uh, more questions, people. Uh, oh, also, I, I, I forgot to say, on the first, on the Carpentry's Handbook, so there I have kind of a translator guide, but that translator guide is only uh, for kind of the general things. As I said before, if you are translating a new language, you should create your own rules. Maybe those rules should also be living in that same documentation for each different language, 
but um, but for example, the Spanish one are still not there, uh, and that's the one that I have more interaction. So I I haven't decided yet what is the right place for those to live because I think that that's something that the, each community, each translation community, should create them and should kind of uh, be the owners of them. So I maybe the easier will be to link to those uh, rules rather than host them in the same place. Uh, so the last question I found there is, is uh, does one simply trust the translators or is a mechanism? So uh, on all those tools, you have a, you translate something and then there's a reviewer. Uh, so essentially you will have two roles. You have the translator role and an editor role. And then you may have in half as well a, a kind of a, a bigger role, like an admin role. But essentially, it's a the translator provide. It's like in GitHub, you have a contribution, and then you have the maintainer who is have the right to to merge the pull request. So here will be the similar. So you propose the translations, and someone will click and say yes, review, or it needs something to change, and then it's now reviewed. Now, when I pull the lessons, uh, the software allows you to pull everything that has only been reviewed or everything, even the things that hasn't been reviewed. So in, in, in a way, there is a, a mechanism for check the translations. Now, we haven't been too strict with that. We only been, uh, everyone who has been translating has been also reviewers in, in the Spanish experience. I don't know in the other communities, uh, just because to alleviate our work. But maybe as we, become part in time and maybe make it more um, stable or, or formalize better the process, then maybe we might have people that only review and then we have only people that only translate and they will have different permissions. And uh, so part of that question you say, so I'm thinking of a site which translate of scientific articles and I wonder how much quality control to do. I suppose QC means quality control. Um, so yeah, that's that's where the editor comes in place uh, and and have a a a overview of the lesson and it knows uh, what is the terms we're going to use. Uh, take care of the glossary as well and see that we are keeping those words in the same way and stuff. More questions, more things. Anyone? Anyone's interested to translate into a new language? There's I've seen people that have here from uh, Spanish, Italian, French, Japanese, Swahili, German. Are you convinced now? I'm hoping to kick off an Italian translation project, uh, David. Cool. Welcome. So decide your lesson, tell me which one you want to do, which start with, and then I can help you to get set up. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, you have your hands up. Yes, I do. Um, I want to ask, um, you mentioned that you need maintainers for um, the internationalization repository on GitHub. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a bit more about what that entails, um, what the time commitment is, um, and what existing skills people should already have yep. and what they can learn on the job. Okay. So uh, in terms of a commitment for a maintainer for the I-18N organization is essentially you will need to know, to be familiar with Git and Git submodules because we are using Git submodules almost everywhere. Um, also, if we put the theme as well as part of those responsibilities, it will be to be familiar with Jekyll. I mean, I'm saying everything that is that I've been doing, not, not that that has to be the same person. So we could have, we could break that into multiple people and, 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 and commitments. Uh, so mostly is familiariz familiarization with how the lessons works. Uh, in the software and the data carpentry and library carpentry, familiarization with Git and Git modules, familiarization with a Jekyll, and and then it's regarding type commitment. I don't know. I've been doing this for two years. 
on a on off like one weekend here one weekend six months later things are not working so it's it depends on how much push we want to do to this so if we have more people this will work more fluently and and maybe the time commitment is not excessive because it's when someone wants to do a new translation that this hasn't been already prepared it will be uh, i managed uh, kind of run to do the scripts and generate this new lesson uh, for people to translate if it's already if it's already translating in a language adding a new language is a two minutes um, or even less because it may transcripts already may have provided those languages already so it will be on the times of when the lesson is translated to pull it down and translate it and yeah i think that's that's it and most of the scripts i've written are in python uh, so if if we need to debug those scripts or to improve those scripts maybe we need to work out with the if the people know Python, we can keep doing it in Python. If uh, the new people I want to help knows a different language and they want to do it in a different, like they're more familiar with the language, like, I'm happy to to switch to something else uh, if that shows uh, that this makes life easier for everyone. Awesome, thank you. Good. Uh, another question here is whether there's a mechanism to set priorities or to suggest the translation to, and what's the urgency? I, that's up to the community. So as the Spanish community started with one of the core lessons, and then because people there were more uh, in a community that were doing more R or ecology, they started to translate those lessons first uh, up, to, up to the community. Right now, because we don't have many things, I don't think there's much of a point of, of making a, a restriction of what needs to be done first. I would say if do what you enjoy more. So if you are new to the translations and you want to translate something, choose a lesson that you will enjoy rather than choosing something that you hate <laughs> uh, because it will make your life easier and you will have, you will do that with more purpose. Um, in the only restriction or the only kind of push we gave uh, was to translate the code of conduct. Uh, as I say, we need to have that. Uh, so we did, haven't translated the rest of the handbook, but we focus on the code of conduct so that we can point to a page that is in Spanish and that was uh, useful for anyone running any workshop. Uh, but essentially, if you if you get a bunch of people uh, and and you distribute the work between the people, I don't. As I say, we run two hackathons two hackathons or translatons in, in the conference. And those were like between six, seven hours. Uh, not everyone that was at the same time, but we were spanning over different time zones. And we have fully translated one lesson and half or maybe a, almost a third of, uh, most than a third of a second lesson of the R geospatial. So if you find the people and you organize yourself and you do what you have more fun with, then you will you will start something. And then, you know, then you will start to attract more community with that and that, that will grow. Uh, any more questions? It's two o'clock already. So um, I'm gonna say thank you to everyone that is here. I'm, I'm happy to stay here for a couple of minutes more if you need anything else. Uh, but for now, uh, feel free to, yeah, leave. Before leaving, please, uh, there is a link in the other path at line 27, which is a, for a, a feedback survey. So please uh, fill it up that before you leave. And yes, I'm gonna stop recording, uh, but feel free to keep asking questions.